Um, today, we're really excited to have Graham Neubig of uh, Carnegie Mellon University visiting. And so Graham's done lots of really interesting and exciting work in natural language processing. Um, he's probably especially well known for his work on statistical and neural machine translation. He's written lots of really great papers and really interesting work in the area. Um, raise your hand if you've been like playing around with deep learning for NLP. You've ever programmed some of these things. So yes, yeah, so it's a very common thing. Lots of people are trying this out. Graham is also co-author of one of the major open source frameworks for building neural net models called Dynex. And it's the one, if you haven't heard of it, it's like PyTorch, but was out before PyTorch. And it's also impressive that it's done all by academics, but it regularly beats TensorFlow or PyTorch and southern ones in performance contests. So basically, it's doing better than the giant software engineering groups at large corporations. So I always think it's really cool. Um, also, Graham's just done tons of really interesting research in areas of multilingual NLP, um, character-based model codes, it turns out. I've done work in predicting linguistic typology, and even work on syntax, and also um, a new work, I guess, on code generation from natural language. So lots of very interesting topics. And so um, he finished, he got his PhD actually at uh, Kyoto University, um, and for the last few years, he's been assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon. And so, Okay. Hello. Can every can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so th thanks for the great introduction, uh, Brendan. So um, today I'm going to talk about what can neural networks teach us about language. Um, so the idea here is um, I, a lot of people raised their hand when they said they were using neural networks or deep learning for natural language processing, and I think a lot of the people. Uh, who raised their hand then are doing basically supervised learning uh, of some sort. Um, so in supervised learning, of course, we have training data, um, which is maybe sentences and parse trees. Uh, let's, then we train a model, we get our you know, neural network model, and then we get unlabeled data where we don't have the parse trees and we want to guess the parse trees uh, from this using the model and predict uh, something like this. And this is where neural networks have been fabulously successful. If you can create a big uh, supervised training set, you can do really amazing things. Like you can do end-to-end -end machine translation, you can do parsing, you can do anything, and your results tend to get a lot better. Um, so one of the reasons why neural networks are so good at this is because uh, neural networks are mini scientists, basically. What they're doing is they're discovering latent features of the problem that you're interested in solving, and they're extracting these features in an appropriate way so that you can, uh, so that you can basically solve this uh, problem better. Um, so you, know, you have your input layer, you have your hidden layers, and then you have your output layer, and hopefully by the time you get to hidden layer number two, the things that are expressed in this vector are things that are uh, relevant or salient to the problem. Um, so, you know, they might, in the case of language, they might be learning something like syntax or semantics. Um, so, but the problem is neural networks are mini scientists, but we're hopefully non-mini scientists, you know, uh, real, uh, real scientists. And we would also like to know what these uh, neural networks are discovering and maybe whether this uh, confirms what we already know about the problem or not, or whether they're doing something entirely different. So there's two reasons why we, we might want to do this. Um, for example, if we're talking about language in particular, this would be a new way of testing our linguistic hypotheses. So one thing about language is there's a whole field of linguistics, which is basically people trying to figure out how language works. And now, because people have been doing linguistics for a long time, we have a pretty good idea of this. Um, and but you know, linguistics is far from solved, and there's all these conflicting theories there about how we do language. And because of this, if we could take a neural network and ask it what it thought about language, uh, it might help us uh, resolve this. Also, on a more practical level, this gives us a basis to further improve the model. So if we understand why it's doing things, why it's uh, doing things well, and why it's making mistakes, then we can, uh, we can focus on things uh, that would help improve it as well. 
So I'm going to talk about, this time, about unsupervised uh, training of neural networks for language. Um, so we have something like unlabeled training data. Um, we do a bunch of training and extract features. And from this, uh, we either talk about induced structure um, or induced features of the language uh, that we're interested in. And then we also get, uh, we also get a model as a side product of this. And I, I have three parts to my talk today. The first part is learning features uh, of a language through translation, um, so we can learn more about the language. Another one is learning about uh, linguistic, or basically verifying linguistic theories by learning how to uh, do parsing of a language. And then a final one, this is, even if you're not interested in any of these, uh, Br uh, Brendan introduced the, uh, the DINET toolkit, but this is some methods that we have introduced into this toolkit that allow you to do the kind of experiments above that allow you to test interesting uh, linguistic hypotheses or come up with uh, structures and still train your methods, uh, train your models in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, learning basically vector representations for an entire language. And what I mean by this, um, what I mean by this is basically we have one vector for English, we have one vector for Chinese, we have one vector for uh, Japanese, and these kind of describe the features of the language that we, uh, that we have. And actually, even if we don't learn features, languages are already described by features um, by linguists who like to categorize languages based on, you know, their, uh, for example, their syntax. So what is the word order? Um, in English, uh, the word order is uh, subject, verb, object. So we have like he bought a car. Um, this is pretty common. Um, but actually, the most common word order in, in the world is this uh, SOV word order, where you put the subject first, the object, and then the verb. And then there are also other uh, more unusual ones, like verb, subject, object in Irish. Oops, sorry. Verb, subject, object in Irish, or uh, verb, object, subject. Uh, and you, you can kind of go into the more esoteric ones that people kind of dispute whether they exist or not as well. But these, these are kind of the, uh, the most common ones. And then there's also other things like how do we conjugate words. Um, so English is a fusional language. Um, it has a little bit of morphology, but not very much. Um, but what I mean by morphology is, uh, like, opened gets uh, opened, becomes opened, uh, etc. Um, Japanese is uh, agglutinative, which means it has a little bit more uh, conjugation. So this akete agita here means uh, opened for, uh, opened for somebody. And then in Mohawk, which is a polysynthetic language, uh, this entire thing becomes a single word. Uh, this entire sentence becomes a single word. So um, this is another classification of language. Um, phonology, uh, what kind of vowel sounds do you have? English has these vowel sounds. Farsi has, uh, has these vowel sounds, has a smaller number. So there's all kinds of these parameters. And um, linguists make these encyclopedias uh, linguists are scientists. They go in and make these encyclopedias of the classifications of all the languages. Oh, I forgot to do my quiz. This is a, always a fun quiz to do, um, but I already gave the answer. So there's actually, um, <laughs> I, I normally ask people how many languages there are in the world, and you might be surprised to hear that there are, um, as far as we know, uh, there are about 7,099 living languages in the world. Um, but although this might be old information, and unfortunately, a lot of the speakers of the uh, more minor languages are old and, uh, and pass away, and then this number is decreasing year by year, but it, we have about 7,000. Um, and there are databases that contain information about their features, like the Word, World Atlas of Language Structures, etc. There's all, all these kind of uh, atlases that linguists tend to make. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to know um, uh, we want to know if we have a new language, what could we expect its, uh, its features to be like. Unfortunately, this information is very incomplete because it's really difficult to make these. Um, 
So the World Atlas of Language Structures, which is kind of the biggest one, um, of all, has about 200 uh, features in 2,500 languages, and about 85% of these are incomplete. This is like an incomplete uh, label problem. So what we have is something that looks like this. We have this matrix where uh, the rows are the languages and the columns are the values that we have, and the white ones are the ones that are missing. So um, there are all, all these languages that, uh, where we don't know the features of them. So the idea is, could we use something like a neural network model to then go in and predict all of these missing values and then maybe propose, this is beyond what we've done now, but what we'd like to do eventually is maybe propose them to the real scientists, the linguists, and say, look, this is what our neural network mini scientist found. Uh, what do you think? Uh, would you be able to use this to fill in this encyclopedia of human knowledge about, uh, about language? So, uh, are there any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. Do you consider Sogar the living language? Um, that would not be included here, I don't think. Um, th this doesn't include sign languages either, uh, this count. This only includes um, spoken, you know, the, the standard definition of language, I guess. Yeah. Anything else? No? OK. So now the question is, how do we learn about an entire language? Um, the answer is, I don't know the answer of how we can do this yet, but we have one way that we tried, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, there's probably a lot of better ways to do this, but um, the way we wor did was pretty simple. Uh, basically, what we do is we prepare you know, a bunch of sentences in this language, uh, like the cat went to the store, the cat bought a deep learning book, uh, the cat learned how to program confnets, the cat needs more GPUs. And um, we use that to encode uh, all the sentences into a bunch of vectors, one, two, three, four uh, vectors. So there are methods, uh, there are methods for doing this. Um, and in order to create representations of each sentence in the language, then we, basically do, um, we combine all of these vectors into, into a single vector here. So if you're familiar with deep learning, basically what we're doing is we're doing a, an encoding of the sentence, and then at the end we have a pooling operation to pool all of the vectors into a single vector for the entire language. Um, and then from that uh, pooled vector, we predict the language traits. So uh, subject, verb, object, uh, fusional morphology has determiners. And by doing this, then um, if these language vectors are accurate, they'll allow us to uh, help predict these traits. Um, so then the question is, how do we represent sentences? And our proposal here is to learn a multilingual translation model, basically. So um, our hypothesis is that if we can take Japanese and translate it into English, Irish translated into English, uh, Malagasy translated into English, etc., cetera, um, then we use a single model uh, where we input all of the sentences in all of these languages, and we also put an extra tag that says this is a sentence from Japanese, this is a sentence from Irish, this is a sentence from Malagasy. And then we extract features from basically the vector representing this token and the intermediate hidden states uh, that we use while we're, um, while we're performing this translation. So to give like a scheme, uh, kind of a scheme diagram of what we're doing, what we do is we, we encode the, uh, the source sentence. We then have a, uh, a neural machine translation model, which basically encodes the sentence and then outputs the, the target one by one. And we take all of the states here and we average them together uh, for each sentence in the language. And then we also take the vector for this language token and we feed both of these in as our kind of representation of the language. Um, so this is an extremely simple method. It's, uh, if you know neural machine translation, it's very easy to do, but I think it's also a well-founded method, and the reason why is in order to do translation well, 
you will need to learn about things like syntax. You will need to learn about things like morphology and, and semantics, et cetera. And because of that, you know, we're basically training the model to do an auxiliary task where we can get data easily without any annotations. But in order to do the task well, you'll have to learn the stuff that we want to know. And I think that's, a, in general, if you're interested in unsupervised learning type things, regardless of it, if it's for language or something else, the really important thing is that in order, you're going to come up with some alternative objective to what you, want to, what you actually want to do. And that alternative objective has to necessitate learning the thing that you want to learn. So I, I think this is a good example of that. Um, there is a, a bit of uh, previous work on this uh, that demonstrated that machine translation hidden states have a correlation with uh, things like syntactic features, including um, syntax and morphology. The main difference between theirs and ours is they did it uh, over particular words in a sentence while we're doing it over an entire language, I guess. So the way we did um, our experiments, uh, we trained a machine translation system on 1,017 languages. I, I think we currently hold the record for the most multilingual machine translation system ever trained. Uh, although you could, you could try to go and beat that. I, I welcome you to. Um, so the, basically the only place where you can get text for 1,000 languages is from the Bible. It's the most translated text in the world. Um, and so we, we downloaded uh, the Bible in a lot of different languages. And uh, because we know the verses um, of, in the Bible, you can align all the sentences. And this allowed us to train this uh, large translation system. Um, we, if you're interested in, in doing this thing, we have the learned language vectors and the code to learn them uh, here. And um, we use this to estimate uh, typological features from the URIEL database, which is a, a database of these typological features here. Um, and then there's a couple baselines uh, that other people have used based on like the similarity of languages uh, in their like language tree, et cetera. Um, so, okay. So taking a look at the results, um, we, the first thing we confirmed is that the learned representations encode information about the entire language and help with predicting the traits. Um, you can see uh, basically the, the top one here is with no kind of neural network based learning. Um, minus aux is with just the majority class. Uh, plus aux is with a bunch of other features proposed by previous work. Um, and you can see that the features that our method learned help both over uh, like kind of the baseline random chance and uh, in previous work. So um, another thing to note here is that we found that the machine translation model is much better than just training a language model. Um, so training a language model means you have to, uh, is basically predicting the next word in the sentence without any bilingual signal. And this kind of confirmed our hypothesis that translation is a good, uh, a good task to learn these things. Also, uh, we examined the trajectories through the sentence of uh, particular nodes in the, uh, in, the gra uh, in, the, in the hidden states of the translation model. And we could find that similar languages uh, have similar trajectories um, for particular nodes, like Portuguese and Catalan tend to be similar. Um, and German and Korean, which both have verbs at the end, tend to be similar in, in some ways. Um, so the, basically the conclusion here is that we can uh, learn about language using unsupervised learning. We can use deep learning and naturally occurring translation data to learn features as a whole. Um, so one of the downsides of this work here is that this is an extremely coarse grain. Basically what you're doing is you're saying, um, hey, neural net, here is a big, uh, you know, here's all the data in a, that we have in a language. Uh, please tell me what this, uh, what this typological feature is. Like, is it a subject object verb language? Or is it a, does it have concatenative morphology, uh, or sorry, agglut agglutinative morphology or something else? But the problem is our originally stated goal was to, help out linguists who would be interested in using these mini scientists to inform their, uh, their final you know, understanding of a language. 
And we're far from that goal because if we just tell them, hey, I think this is subject object verb, the linguist will be like, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know whether to believe you or not. So uh, kind of the next thing that we're, uh, we're very interested in doing is actually telling the model why we thought this, giving examples and, um, and allowing it to you know, help uh, people in that way. So um, I'll, I'll talk about some preliminary work in that direction, but are, are there any questions? Uh -huh. Yes, we do. Um, so for the language modeling one, um, for the language modeling one, we don't. Um, so the LM, LM vec here, uh, we don't. Um, for all of the ones that have MT here, you do. But you'll notice that basically the, the LM vec one, um, in addition to the features that they already had, it's basically no, it, it doesn't give you any improvement, but using the machine translation it does. So having parallel data is, uh, is pretty essential for this. Yep. Right. So th that's, that's a very nice paper. If you don't know this, basically what they, tra what they did was they, uh, they trained a machine translation model to learn word embeddings and then use the word embeddings in supervised uh, training tasks. And this is kind of an expansion over using language models uh, for supervised training, which people had done before. It's also kind of similar to the work that I cited down here, um, but the work I cited down here just examined uh, whether they were learning things or not and didn't actually use it for a downstream task. So I, I think that is a, a, a good paper to take a look at if you're interested. Um, Okay, uh, and anything else? No? Okay, so I'll move on to the, uh, the next one. Um, so this is a more focused examination about um, what can neural networks learn about syntax. The actual name is what can recurrent neural network grammars learn about syntax. Um, and First, to give a little bit of background, um, normally when we talk about generating, uh, when we talk about generating sentences, uh, are people are familiar with language modeling. Um, so when we talk about a language model, usually what we talk about is we talk about generating the first word, uh, then the second word, then the third word, then the fourth word. And we have a conditional probability of the next word given the, um, given the previous words. But another way that we can do this, um, which is a little bit po less popular but very effective, is um, to define a joint probability over a latent structure of the sentence, for example, a syntax tree, and all of the words. So in this case, uh, this x is all of the um, this x is all of the words in the sentence, and then the y would be the latent structure, like the syntax tree here. Um, and First, I'll, I'll give a crash course on recurrent neural network grammars, which are a way to do this. And then I'll talk about answering uh, linguistic questions through learning uh, these uh, models. So basically, the way a recurrent neural network uh, grammar works is um, we have a tree. And we expand this tree um, into uh, kind of like the S expression style, uh, if you're familiar with this from Lisp or, or whatever. Um, and so we, we have open brackets and closed brackets, uh, which shows that the, at the very top we have a sentence, then we have a noun phrase, then we have a verb phrase. Um, then we formulate this in, um, in something that's basically a shift reduce type uh, format, where we have uh, different actions, and these actions um, determine, or these actions describe how we generate this tree. So the first thing we do is we generate the S uh, with the open bracket. Uh, then we generate the NP with an open bracket. Um, so now we have uh, S, NP uh, on something called the stack. And we generate the, um, hungry, and cat. And then we have a reduce action. And the, what the reduce action does is it basically takes all of the things up until the previous open bracket and composes them into one representation. Um, and then we can step through the entire sentence and, and, um, 
and generate them in this way. But the, the reason why this model is kind of nice, um, it gets good results on language modeling, et cetera. But the reason why it's nice is basically um, here on this stack that we have here, we have the previous things we generated, and then we also have phrases represented as a single vector. And by representing the phrases as a single vector, we can model the fact that language is compositional. Um, and you know, a noun phrase can act basically like a noun. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give some examples of this later. But anyway, this is a, this is a very uh, good model uh, for um, both language modeling and parsing. Um, we also have, uh, so the stack is the most important thing and it's kind of the thing that makes the recurrent neural network grammar what it is. Um, we also have a couple other things like past actions and also the, the words that we generated previously. Um, but these are kind of more, uh, more standard. So the reason why I say it's good um, is because number one, it's linguistically kind of well-founded. Uh, number two, it's also very effective. It's it, still one of the best parsing models, uh, one of the best models for syntactic parsing uh, that we have. Um, it's also a, a better model for, um, for language modeling than just using sequential, sequential LSTMs because it models the information flow um, in a linguistically appropriate way. Um, but what I'm going to talk about here is whether we can use this model to actually examine what the decisions it's making and uh, learn about uh, language in the process. So there are a couple things um, about language that we know are basically true, I guess not know are true, but they're linguistic theories about how language works. One of them is lexicalization, um, where basically if we have a, phrase, a noun phrase and we go through, Usually there's a single word in the phrase that kind of concisely summarizes what the whole phrase is about. Uh, this is called the semantic head or syntactic head, depending on whether you're talking about semantics or syntax. But in this case, the hungry cat is a cat. Um, it's a special kind of cat, but it, it's a cat. Um, another thing uh, that is theoretically um, useful is knowing what type of phrase you're handling. So knowing it's a noun phrase or a verb phrase or something like this. Uh, so when we're creating sentences, we don't suddenly put an adjective where you can only have a noun, right? So I wouldn't say, I ate the blue. That would be, that would be a bad sentence. So this is also something we know about, uh, we know about language. So what we want to do then is we want to take this model and figure out whether it learns these things in the process of learning to parse very well. Um, and so one, what we did was we modified this model to make it more interpretable, basically. Um, and so if we, uh, to just go a little bit more into headedness. So headedness basically says that uh, phrases are strongly, uh, have a strongly privileged lexical head that determines the whole representation. Actually, sorry, I, I already said this on the previous slide, so that, that's what I was saying. A cat is basically, the hungry cat is basically a cat. So, um, in the previous formulation of the recurrent neural network grammar model, basically what they did is um, they had a bidirectional LSTM uh, that reads all the words in the phrase. And then you take, the last, um, you take the last state of this LSTM and use it to represent the whole phrase. So this is nice, I guess. It, it works relatively well. But the problem is that this, um, it's not very easy to tell which uh, thing was the most important when you're deciding uh, what the phrase representation should be. So what we did instead was we, uh, we switched this into an attention model. Uh, so the attention model basically explicitly tells you which, uh, which word you're focusing on. Um, so the idea here is that for each of the, the words in the phrase, for the, for hungry, and for cat, we calculate um, basically an attention score, a probability that we're focusing on that particular word, and then we take the weighted sum of all of these. So um, the model 
this will be completely learned by the model. We're not specifying these alpha values ahead of time, but uh, we add uh, we add this as a um, uh, we change the composition function into this. And by doing this, basically what we can do is we can say the word that gets the highest attention score, this is probably the head of the phrase. So, um, the first thing we did was we basically confirmed that this, was, this didn't break our entire model. Because, you know, if we, if we take the BiLSTM model and convert it into an attention model and suddenly it's horrible at everything we asked it to do before, then in a way that's, you know, th that's going against what we want to be doing. So what we did was we, um, uh, we first validated that the, the attention uh, didn't, you know, break the model and it, it seems to be doing fine. So then the next thing, um, the next thing we examined is, let's say the theory of headedness was 100% correct. So there's a single word in the phrase that entirely, um, entirely tells you the, uh, the meaning of the phrase. So then we would just have to pick one of them and we would get a one hot vector over all of the children and we would pick that single, uh, we would pick that single child to represent the phrase and that would work uh, perfectly well. On the other hand, let's say the linguistic theory of headedness was entirely false. Uh, let's say we, um, uh, there was no reason to pick a head and just averaging together all the words is a good way to represent the phrase. So in this case, um, all, of the, uh, all of these would be uniform. And, the, uh, and if we express this in a, um, in a kind of uh, quantitative way, uh, we can measure the perplexity. So if it's a completely peaky distribution, our perplexity is going to be one. If it's a completely uniform distribution, our perplexity is going to be equal to the number of choices we can make. So then the question is, wh where does our learned model fall in between these two, uh, these two extremes? And the answer is, um, if you look phrase by phrase um, at, all of the, uh, at all of the different phrases, so like an adjective phrase, a verb phrase, noun phrase, uh, prepositional phrase, actually for quantifier phrase, yeah, um, and, uh, and relative clause. You can see that for all of these, um, in particular for quantifier phrases, which are things like what, why, when, um, and, uh, and relative clauses, you can see that it is less than uniform, but more than, uh, more than perfectly peaky. So it's kind of, the answer is in the middle. Uh, about the, the headedness question. And we can see, if we look at the words that it focuses on, um, in many cases it does learn to focus on the, on the word that we thought would be the semantic head. So in this case, the final hour, hour should be the head, and it focuses on that with 81%. Um, their first test focuses it on with, uh, with 77%. Um, on the other hand, there are ones where it's really impossible to say which is the which is the head in this case it decided to focus on apple um which makes you feel a little bit sorry for compaq and ibm um maybe it was a bad sign for compaq which is now out of business so <laughs> uh then for other ones this one is a kind of uh maybe not not the easiest to interpret but when it has two noun phrases and it combines them together instead it's focusing on and and saying now I know this is a, a coordinate phrase uh, where we have two uh, things with the same meaning together. Um, for verb phrases, it was, uh, it's a little bit less obvious. Uh, so it will often focus on two. Sometimes it focused on the negation, uh, et cetera. Um, for prepositional phrases, it, um, it always focused on the preposition. So, in this case, what kind of preposition it was was the most important for uh, for syntactic parsing task. Um, so one thing I should mention here is that here we're training the model to be able to parse, uh, do syntactic parsing, which means it has to be able to recover the phrase structure very accurately. Um, the answer for this might be very different if we were training it on like a semantic task, like classification or sentiment analysis or something else. And in that case, maybe this noun phrase would be, uh, would be more 
uh, important. So uh, it's important to remember these analysis results are a res result of you, um, uh, are a result of you, uh, what uh, objective you traded on. So another thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to use this to quantify our existing linguistic hypotheses. So in order to do this, in this case, we can actually do this because we already know what linguists say are the heads of, uh, are the heads of sentences, or sorry, of phrases. So we take the, um, we take the linguistic uh, hypothesis that we already have and we compare how this, uh, this uh, overlaps with what we, uh, with what we decided, uh, with what the model decided. And the answer here, this UAS is uh, unlabeled attachment score, which is basically how, how much do things overlap. And the answer is random is 28.6%. Um, there's uh, some paper, uh, there's some rules that were created by uh, Mike Collins, who's at Columbia, I believe, and um, also some rules created by people at Stanford. And our model agreed with uh, Columbia 49.8% of the time and Stanford 44.4% of the time, 40.4% of the time. So obviously Columbia is better than Stanford. No, just, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is um, the, the interesting thing here is that we can see that it's well over chance. Uh, what it's learning is well over chance, but it doesn't necessarily agree with exactly uh, what we um, have talked about before and you know the the divergences examining the divergences and uh, why they tend to happen might also lead to us creating better models so what if we could create a a dependency parsing a, a rules to create dependency heads that more closely matched uh, what we had in this uh, what our model learned maybe that would help our downstream tasks as well um, Another thing we did was we measured whether the model could learn uh, phrase types. So basically we deleted the, the explicit category labels and replaced them all with X. Um, and then we trained, um, we trained the model. And yeah, let me skip that. So we do this and um, we, uh, the first thing we did was, do we gain anything by having the labels? And the answer is we gain a little bit of uh, parsing accuracy, but not a whole lot. Um, so what this shows is that having linguistically annotated labels helps, but it doesn't help a huge amount. But perhaps the more interesting thing is then we went back and we visualized the embeddings learned by each phrase, and we compared them uh, with the actual embeddings that were labeled by the annotators. And when we did, you can see these cluster very nicely, right? The, the S labels are all clustered together in the embedding space. The MP labels are here, S bar labels are here. But wait a second, there's this cluster of things down here that don't match with our intuition. So what are these? Why, um, you know, why do these labels appear here instead of other places? So this might indicate that our labeling scheme is not rich enough and, um, and we actually should re-examine uh, some of the hypotheses that caused us to label them in this way. So the conclusion here is that we, can, we could go back and we could change an existing model that we already know is a good model. Um, it, we ablated some parts of it, like we changed the LSTM into attention, we removed the explicit labels, and we went back and examined what it learned, and we compared it with what we already think we know. And that's uh, another way to examine things as well. Um, so are there any other questions about this? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so is the composition function, is it weighted averaging based on the attention loop, or is it more complicated? Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah. Okay. So in those cases where the preposition is mostly the head, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little puzzling because I guess for, you know, PP attachment, you would think it's the prepositional, semantic information with the prepositional object mm -hmm. is what you're going to need. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what things can you do with telescopes, right? Mm -hmm. So, so one, one other thing I should mention is that the, this is actually context dependent. So um, in the case where we have an NP down here, um, depending on the NP, these values will change a little bit. So 
the, the representation of this NP will be different depending on what is actually included in the content. So I believe this is an average over all examples where we saw this. Um, so there might be some, there might be some examples where, uh, where that was not the case. Um, so yeah, where it might keep it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that, that's a good question. That's from the previous section, but to um, to explain about the added advantage of using all of the languages, um, I guess the important thing is that when you go and predict the typological features, you need to have enough examples of each feature in your training data in order to be able to make that prediction. So for example, if you have a kind of rare feature of a language, like um, polysynthetic morphology is a, a relatively rare feature, you need to have vectors and that label in your training data for the typology classifier in order to make that prediction. And the vectors have to be consistent in space. They have to mean the same thing across all of the languages in that data. So because of that, we really, a thousand isn't enough. We would like more. Um, but, you know, there are only so many languages in the world. So, yeah. On the visualization group, uh -huh. uh, with the S bars, for example, uh -huh. well, not in the right cluster. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I am certain the first author on the paper has done this, uh, and I, I'll, I'll try to channel him and not say something wrong, but if I say something wrong, I apologize. But I, there's a bunch of different varieties of S-bars. Um, so for example, uh, ones that come under quests, uh, um, once that come under questions, like when do you think you will go to the store? Um, and other ones like uh, I, I, like to, I like to go to the store. Um, and because S-bars show up in a bunch of different contexts, uh, it makes sense that some of them would look a little bit more like regular verb phrases, um, especially ones that appear in like con conjunctions or something like this. Um, but I, I actually am not 100% certain about what those were in particular. Yeah. So for the application vector with mm -hmm. so what's the object function you are trying to optimize? So I'm wondering uh -huh. if you change the uh, object function, maybe the length Yes, definitely. So, so for this task, the objective function for this task, the objective function is how well can you predict uh, these parsing actions. So this, this objective function is a purely syn syntactic objective function. It's just can you get the structure of the sentence correct. And it's nothing about semantics or anything like that. So. Syntactic structure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right that it might change if we change the objective. So. Um, okay, so finally, um, if there are any questions about the previous stuff, I could uh, do them at the end. But last, I would like to talk a little bit about a kind of a general purpose method that uh, for uh, machine learning that is very useful in these kind of uh, research uh, problems. And one of the things uh, when using neural networks in, uh, in machine learning it, or n using neural networks in your research is that um, batching together operations is really, really important. Um, if you're familiar with uh, neural networks, you know that about mini-batching and putting multiple data points in the same thing. But anyway, the reason why mini-batching is useful is because um, on, excuse me, on modern hardware, um, 10 operations of size 1 is much slower than one operation of size 10. So if you have um, a matrix multiply where you have a 512, 512 matrix, and you multiply it with a, a vector of length 512, that's a lot slower than doing a 512, 512 by uh, 512 by 10 matrix multiply. So 
so if you do the matrix vector multiply 10 times, it's much slower than uh, doing a single matrix matrix multiply. And this is especially true on GPUs, but also uh, true on CPUs as well. So what mini batching does is it combines together smaller operations into uh, one big one. So an example here is, uh, this is a standard neural network layer, a 10, 10 H uh, weight matrix times data uh, plus bias vector. And instead of doing this three times, we concatenate all of these, uh, these data vectors together into one matrix, and then we multiply it by, uh, by this weight matrix. And um, because you're reducing the number of operations, you, you do better on GPUs, which uh, are very slow at starting up operations. And CPUs can move memory, uh, use uh, memory uh, caches better, et cetera. So normally what you have to do for manual mini batching um, is you group sentences into a mini batch. Uh, optionally for efficiency, you might uh, group them by length or something like that. And then at every time step, you select the teeth word in the sentence and you process them all together uh, and send them to the lookup and loss functions. Um, so are people familiar with this? Some, some people familiar with this? Yeah. Is this a pain to do? It's the hardest part of implementing these models. So I, I, I totally agree, which is why we did this. <laughs> so this, this is a huge pain uh, when you're implementing neural network models, especially for natural language processing, um, but also for other things like reinforcement learning where you have dynamic decisions, et cetera. Um, so the idea is that within Dynet, which uh, Brendan gave me a very good uh, introduction to, um, we created a method that makes it easier for you to implement models without having to do this explicitly. Um, so uh, to introduce Dynet, basically it's a, a dynamic graph toolkit. It's very similar to PyTorch. Um, it's been around for a while longer than PyTorch, uh, but um, it also s another one is Chainer. It's been uh, the two before then. Um, one thing is that it's very fast on CPU, which is good for doing things that have lots of small operations, which is nice for NLP. Um, and it also supports for on-the-fly uh, batching and implement uh, on-the-fly batching, which I'll explain here. So the way you normally batch things together, um, for example, in Dynet, uh, the way you normally batch things together is instead of uh, looking up a single word, um, and then running some operations over it and calculating your loss function. Instead, you look up several different words from all of the examples in your mini batch, uh, all in a single operation. So this would pick the first word of uh, all your examples, the second word of all your examples, et cetera. And then you also calculate your loss function over all of your labels instead of, uh, instead of just one label at a time. Um, but the problem is, you can do this for things like sequences that are the same length, images, uh, et cetera. But what if you wanted to do something like create a model of words where you had a word embedding and then you had morphemes and then you had characters all at the same time? Uh, suddenly, each time you calculate a word embedding, you're doing different operations. So it becomes very difficult to coordinate all of these things together. Um, what if we had a composition function for phrases like we had in the RNNG? Or what if we had uh, sentences with tree structure where all of the trees are different. Um, or documents where all of the, the words in the document were different. So the idea here is um, that within Dynet we've implemented something called automatic mini batching and basically what it does is it automatically discovers operations that can be batched together without you having to do it explicitly. So this is an example, it's a GIF. So you run Independently, you basically run a for loop over all of your sentences and calculate your loss function, for example. Then you sum their loss function uh, values all together. And then the auto batching engine in the, in the background, without you thinking about it, basically finds the operations that can be batched together um, because they're the same type. And it steps through the graph executing these in parallel um, across all the sentences. So it's basically like what you would be doing. Um, normally what you would do is you would write a for loop over all of the words in the sentence um, and you would process them in parallel by inputting them all at the same time. What this is doing is it's doing a for loop over all of the nodes in the graph and batching the ones together that can be batched together. So 
Um, the nice thing about this is now you don't need to write batching code. You just write a for loop over multiple sentences, combine their losses together, and, uh, and run this. Um, so yeah, that, this is what it looks like. It's literally about three a three line change to unbatched code. Um, and we have some experimental results. This was, uh, this was presented at NIPS uh, this year. And basically the, um, the idea, or basically the, if you look at the top one and the fourth one, the top one is running without batching and the bottom one is running with manual batching where you go through the trouble of, uh, of batching everything together. And the, um, you can see by comparing the first one and the fourth one that it's absolutely essential to do batching. Oh, sorry, this is, uh, this is time per sentence. So you can see it's like 20, 20 times faster if you, if you do batching. Then the second line and third line are two different varieties of our auto-batching algorithm. The third one is kind of like our proposed method. Um, and you can see that without doing manual batching yourself, you can get pretty close. Uh, you can get a large majority of the gains that you got uh, using uh, manual batching. And you're still a little bit slower because there's some overhead with the, the auto-batching engine going in and uh, and finding all of the batching opportunities for each sentence, but it, it does a pretty good, uh, pretty good job of this and gets you pretty close. Um, the top one is kind of like the best case scenario. It's a fixed size recurrent neural network, which you can easily manually batch anyway. Uh, so we also tested on, on a bunch of more kind of more difficult things, like increasingly difficult by LSTM, by LSTM with character embeddings, uh, tree LSTM, and a transition-based parsing model. Uh, the transition-based parsing model is making dynamic decisions within the graph, so it's kind of like a reinforcement learning model or, or something like that uh, during training time. Um, and you can see for all of them, it gets anywhere from 10 times to, uh, to maybe four times faster. So this is a really nice tool to have. Um, if you just implement something and then you turn it on, sometimes your code gets 30% faster. Uh, your manual, uh, already manually batched code gets 30% faster because you didn't uh, do the ideal version of batching. So it's kind of fun to, uh, to try out if you're interested. Especially for uh, kind of like complicated structured things. Um, so yeah, that's all for my talk. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what did neural networks teach us about language? So the, um, if I go back to the headedness thing, wait, where are the, where are the examples? So, one thing that is kind of obvious here is that if you're interested in syntax tasks, you really should be using the prepositions as a head. Um, this is not always necessarily done. This is not done in Stanford dependencies, right. I think, so for the example. Head rules, I think these are prepositional yeah, exactly. I'm a lot of disagreement with that. Yeah. So the Collins head rules were designed to make like a lexicalized PCFG work well. Yeah. And so I think it seems crazy to think a lexicalized PCFG should use the preposition as because you can, maybe, maybe I'm just totally wrong, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it's just like, this class of models is so mm -hmm. different than what a linguistic theory based on explicit representations like the Collins model is uh -huh. doing, that you need something different? Or is it just linguistic theories are really wrong here? Well, I, I think the, the thing that it can teach us is particularly for this, uh, this task of syntactic parsing, we should think very carefully about whether the assumptions made by particular linguistic theories are actually ideal for this particular task. So um, uh, another, um, so I, I guess that's the main thing here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So we're not talking about semantics, we're talking about syntax here. Um, because our objective is uh, a syntactic objective. And I think in that case, if you think about it, knowing whether a pre prepositional phrase starts with of, or in, or something else, is a pretty good indicator of whether it should pair with a specific verb, right? So if you think about, um, for example, phrasal verbs, is the obvious is the obvious case. So phrasal verbs, literally, you have to know the the preposition to be able to say whether that's a, a phrasal verb or uh, that phrasal verb is active or not. So go go out, um, go out with somebody, uh, you know, stuff like that. So um, I, I think this is not this doesn't make sense. And I think the fact that we're some not arguing, but discussing this is a very good outcome of a model like this, right? You know, if you, if you just sit on your laurels and, and you know, think that you have, uh, have figured something out, then that's probably less than ideal. And having a way to examine it might be useful, is, I guess, my point. I'm sorry, quick record. Yeah. What was wrong with the content rules? They put the preposition in the head. Uh, okay, which might be why we agree more. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot.